Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Leandra Jung, and we are going to be speaking about darndest things that parents ask on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you again for joining us for this episode. We're joined by uh, Dr. Leandra Jung, and uh, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Leandra did her uh, residency several years ago and uh, is now crushing it in the myopia world. Tell us a little bit about what you are up to these days. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't been that long. So I uh, went to optometry school at Pacific, and then I did my residency in primary care and contact lenses um, in the 2020 year. And now I stayed on a faculty at UC Berkeley, and I'm an assistant clinical professor where I teach optometry students and research myopia. Um, I also work in private practice where I prescribe full scope myopia management, and I do a little bit of consulting and education with Cooper Vision. All right. Uh, what kind of things are you excited about with research in myopia? I think it's both super exciting, but super challenging because there's so much that we don't know, but there's so much that we're learning still. So, yeah. you know, we know this is an exciting age. This is myopic times because especially in the last few years um, and with COVID, all of our worlds are so up close. So um, clinically, I think we've had a lot more patients, a lot more parents asking about myopia and how their children's eyes are being affected uh, by at home school um, and video games, pretty much all the things that kids do these days, um, as well as an exciting time where we're having more FDA approved treatments of myopia control and the research is showing us that it works and that we can do something about it. So. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's very exciting. Are you able to tell us at all of the overlying arching areas of what you're working on with research? Um, I know you can't tell us granularly and specifically about them, but. Yeah. I think one of the exciting projects that um, I'm working on right now is trying, trying to get a database of um, a bunch of different eyes, not even just myopic eyes, but hyperopic eyes too, and figuring out when does myopia start? We look at all the components of the eye and we try to catch it as early as possible uh, to find out how soon can we start treating it. Yeah. So... I think what you're kind of talking about there is this pre-myopia, right? So does myopia progression begin in a different way than emetropization, mm -hmm. right? Is that kind of what you're, uh, you're leaning into? Exactly. Wow. Wouldn't that be great if we could, uh, at some point in a five-year-old, be able to say, hey, you're a plus one right now, but... Yeah, uh, there's ways that we can intervene. Because once the components of the eye kind of get off balance and they don't work together anymore, the growth of the eye is confused. So mm -hmm. um, once that begins, it's a lot harder to catch up on. So the earlier that we can find it, uh, I'm a big fan of preventative medicine. So I think that would be uh, the key to catching all of these uh, early myopes. Yeah. Well, I, uh, that leads me into some things I kind of wanted to talk with you about. You've been in practice now a, a couple of years, and I think those of us who are seeing patients are constantly hearing and talking with, with parents about aspects of myopia. And, uh, and, you know, one of the crazy things that I hear relates to just what you said is that, well, his prescription is not that bad, right? So can we just wait? right? And can we wait a little while and see what happens, right? I think that's something that we are constantly hearing. And that's just mm -hmm. like this crazy concept, because we now know that the number one predictor of the amount of myopia that you're going to have is the age of onset, 
And so we know what's going to happen to little Johnny over the next three years. So we, we now know that, right? But uh, how do we, uh, how do you kind of address that with parents? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, you know, myopes are, are bread and butter in optometry. And yes, hyperopes need us too. Yes, emetropes need us too to check the health of their eye. But the patients that come to us every year after year for their contacts or they're updated for their scratch glasses, they're myopes. They depend so much on their visual correction. Um, and since myopia management has come into the game, a lot of these high, moderate myopes that have kids now, they had no idea that myopia management even exists. So most of the time, it's not just when I have a primary care um, PEDS exam, it's when I have adult patients and I tell them about myopia management and then that opens up a door of conversation about their children. Or, and so often I have them tell me, I wish that I could have done this 20 years ago. If this existed, mm-hmm. I would have been like very happy to know about this treatment. But that's the ones that understand it. Right? So how, what about the ones that are like, let's just let Johnny slide. Let's see what happens next year. There's a bit of mind blowing that happens in these conversations too. And they're like, yeah. what do you mean I can have contact lenses for my kid? Or um, I could have done something differently that you guys are learning now. So, yeah, it's a, it's a big conversation and all sorts of questions get asked. Um, like what? Like what kind of crazy questions have you heard from parents? All sorts of things. I mean, um, I'm sure you've heard a lot of similar ones, too. Um, but they'll ask me about their kids and saying, you know, I, I think that wearing glasses actually makes my kids eyes worse though. Right. Like, should I not give them such strong glasses and will that make them more nearsighted? I don't want to see that number go up on their prescription. So let's just keep it as low as possible or even cut it a little bit. All right. So let's talk a little bit about under correcting or not correcting. Uh, Do we expect progression to stay the same? I mean, what I usually tell them is that undercorrecting kids' vision isn't actually helpful. And we want to make sure that even when we prescribe myopia treatment, that they can still see clearly. Uh, it's really important for them during this time as their brain is developing and they need good vision to do fundamental kid stuff like learning how to read. Uh, with both soft contact lenses and ortho K, we know that um, inducing some peripheral blur is helpful but keeping the optics crisp at the center is also really important. So I don't usually undermine his patients. What about you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. And uh, we've, got, we've got plenty of evidence that is out there that says that the undercorrection of myopia actually leads to a further progression of myopia. Um, there, are, there are several studies that show that there was a study that was done by Alder in 2006 and Chung in 2002, and they were uh, comparing full correction to under correction. And uh, they found a 16% increase in, uh, in progression or in, in, in Chung found 22% increase in progression for under corrected children. So under correction, not only makes it blurry for the kid, but it also causes the progression of their nearsightedness to happen faster. Mm -hmm. And so it's an absolute no. And the other thing I think about this that's really important is if you do have somebody who's fast progressing and they absolutely refuse to do myopia management, you can still do myopia management to a degree by bringing them back at three or six months and giving them a new pair of glasses. And and here's what I mean by that. Let's imagine we know that Tommy is going to be uh, progressing by, let's say, a diopter, assuming he's fully corrected the entirety of the year. And so at day one, and then at day uh, day 365, he's now progressed a diopter. Well, if that's assuming Tommy's fully corrected the entirety of the time, if Tommy comes in at six months 
and you don't give him a new uh, prescription, he's now, let's say, uh, a half a diopter undercorrected. That means that Tommy's going to be at a minus 125 or maybe even a minus 150 because his undercorrection at six months is now driving further progression than what he have had if he had been corrected fully the entirety of the time. So, you know, one way of doing myopia management, if somebody is refusing to do ortho K, atropine, you know, the, the spectacle lenses or, 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 you know, soft multifocal, to just make sure that their prescription is accurate year mm -hmm. round, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a key thing. So what else are you hearing? Um, let's see. I get a lot of the time, there's no way that my eight year old camera contact lenses. Oh, yeah. I'm not too yeah. young for contacts or the eye is so small, there's no way that I can get this lens in their eye. Um, mm -hmm. How old is the youngest patient that you've put in myopia management or uh, your contact lenses? Yeah, probably, probably four. I think probably four is is usually the the the, the youngest that we've we've started in our office. You know, there may be a case that we had uh, done some level of contact lenses even younger than that for other other pediatric reasons. Mm -hmm. But uh, usually in the myopia management space, usually I think four is about where we've started. Yeah. For me, I think the youngest I've done is five. And yeah. even within that, there's such a range of kids. And some kids are really good about having contact lenses in their eye. And sometimes there's some crying or some <laughs> some words, but uh, a lot of the time they adapt really, really well. Yeah. And it's totally possible. Yeah. You know, you, you bring up a, a really good point that was asked in our in our industry years ago. And uh, you'd have to give credit to Johnson and Johnson for helping to kind of lead the charge with this. And there was a study that was published in 2007 called the CLIP study. And uh, it looked at contact lenses in pediatrics, right, CLIP. And um, what they were looking at is they were looking at kids 8 to 12. So maybe not as young as we're talking about, but 8 to 12. And they compared that subgroup of patients to teenagers. And they looked at all of the different aspects of uh, the contact lens wearing process. And you know what the major thing that they found was the difference between them was the chair time. The amount of time in the office was about 15 minutes longer in pediatrics. But beyond that, it was about the same. You know, I, I think they looked at comfort and vision and all different aspects. Now that's eight. I don't know that uh, that necessarily changes a lot be younger than that. I think it really kind of depends on kids, right? So you'll find some six-year-olds that are far more mature than a nine-year-old. <laughs> and then you find some nine-year-olds who, you know, they they shouldn't be in contact lenses at all. But uh, but they just need that, that, that parental. And I think it probably matters more on the parents being able to really work with the kids is what I've kind of observed. What are the things that you kind of talk with the parents about with those younger kids to help them feel more confident fitting them in contact lenses. Right. Yeah. Another uh, common question I get from parents, uh, this one isn't as crazy. It's a very valid concern is, well, is it safe for my child to be wearing contact lenses? Right. And I think yeah. um, there have been studies and research done where they mm -hmm. compare kids versus young adult and, and contact lens wearing and habits. Yeah. And they find that, even with overnight lenses for kids that under good compliance, uh, good education, so they learn all the rules about um, how to take care of their contact lenses and good parental oversight. And there's really, really good outcomes. So uh, I don't feel so nervous about having kids in contact lenses when they have uh, a good doctor and follow up with a good uh, regimen of making sure yeah. their eyes are healthy. In fact, you know, younger kids can in some ways be uh, better or more compliant than older kids because they get into the right routine, mm -hmm. you know, earlier and they may be more prone to do things the right way. For instance, 
if I tell my kids to hurry up when they're brushing their teeth, they're like, but I have to brush my teeth for two minutes. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, yes, that is right. There's probably times where I quit before two minutes is up. Uh, but that, that that's what they're supposed to do. And they were told to do that. And that's, you know, that's the way they do it. And uh, so I think kids can be really good about doing things correctly, washing the lenses, washing their hands ahead of time. You just have to get them in that right regimen. And, uh, you know, one of the things I think is really important is, to get the kids on board about what's the right way to do things. Um, I know some offices use quizzes that they have the kids fill out or something like that. Do you have anything that you do to try, try to bring the kids into that? Oh, yeah. I think one of the cutest things um, and my favorite things about working with pediatric patients is watching them take responsibility for their eye care because they know that's how they're going to see well. So um, we give them a kit and they have their little plunger to remove it and they think that's the cutest thing ever. Stickers go a really long way with kids. Plungers go even further with them. But as if they have their own little case and their kit, um, they're pretty happy. Yeah. You know, I uh, just interviewed Ton May, um, and he practices in um, he practices in Orange County, and uh, he does something really cool in his office in that he uh, he gives his kids points based on things that they're doing. And uh, so when they show up for their exam, right, they get points. If mom takes a picture and posts it on her social media, the kid gets points. Mm. And you can throw the points in for anything, right? Bringing your contact lenses with you to the appointment, you know, showing the, you know, contact lens technician, how you clean them and doing it correctly. And you get points. And then those points are like the tickets at the arcade. They can trade them in for a little stuffed animal or, you know, a little candy bar or something. And, you know, they're just excited to work for it. He also gives all the kids t-shirts when they start myopia management. And if they wear the t-shirt into the office, they get points. And he's like, it's great marketing for school because they have to wear their t-shirt at school. Ah. And uh, it's, it's brilliant. He's, you know, he's really, really smart. But, you know, those little things that you're encouraging the kids to do that they are doing it for an external motivator, but yet they're learning something along the way, stickers or, you know, little things that you do. We, we don't do the point systems yet, but it certainly was a, you know, incredible thing that he's doing. I think would be a great way to implement into our practice. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're onto cool. something in optometry arcade. I think I'd go there. <laughs> yeah, I think adults would go there. Yes. Yes. Very much. But they need to what take some. Of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are some of the other ones that we have is, um, you know, uh, sometimes it's about the cleaning of the lenses, right? Like the parents are asking about cleaning. Um, parents are asking about wearing the lenses all day long. What are some of the other questions that you have? Oh, oh, I got one for you. Yeah. Does he have to wear it every day? That's a question that sometimes gets asked. How do you answer that one? Yeah, I, I mean, depending on the method of myopia management, right? It's really common for ortho k wearers to wear their lenses every night and that makes it a good treatment because of the compliance um they're getting their the the um defocus every single day and they need yep. to and obviously clearly whereas sometimes i think with soft lenses you know uh, they might take a day off because they can wear their glasses as backup and that's okay too so for some patients you know on a weekend night if they're gonna want to have a sleepover with friends or if they want to, um, you know, go outside and play and don't want to have to, or their nighttime routine is a little bit different or they had a long day or something, they, they might want to take a day off. And, but they do notice that their vision is blurry the next day. So sometimes they're motivated to do, to do it every day. But I think taking a day off is okay. Yeah, I share with them that as well. And, you know, there's a study that talks about partial correction, still slowing the progression of myopia. If you don't, you know, if you, it, it, where they took, I think minus five, minus six is, and they corrected them to three or four prescription, right? So they were like about 50% correction with orthokeratology mm -hmm. and they still showed that they slowed down the progression. So what that's told me is that if my 
my kiddos forget to wear their lenses. We're not losing the myopia effect. Obviously, they may lose some visual correction, but doing that on a on a on a, on a everyday basis would be bad. But an occasional thing. So I tell moms and dads that you know if you need to hold something over the kid, you know it's okay for them to stop wearing their lenses. Or maybe Saturday night is a free night where they don't have to wear their lenses. And then I always share, hey, if your kid's going to go spend the night at a friend's house, Mm -hmm. just don't worry about the lenses. Don't, don't, you know, if they're going to grandma's for the night, just forget about it. Uh, If you're going to go on an airplane and you're going to land somewhere and it's later in the evening, just forget them for for one night. But Mm -hmm. not a big deal about doing it in those scenarios. Yeah, I think so too. Um, okay, I just thought of one. And I don't know about you, but I, I can feel the atmosphere in the room, in the exam room, change a little bit. And does it get a little hotter? It or does. Is the, the air gets thicker? Yeah, when we start, start talking about screens. Because oh. the kid is like literally grasping onto their imaginary iPad. And they're like, no, 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 don't ask, don't ask. <laughs> and they'll, the parent will look at you and be like, well, what do you think about all this screen time? Like, we should have zero screen time, right? Like giving me a very um, convincing glance. But um, then it becomes negotiation space where I want the kids to still believe in me and think about all the other good tips about his eye care that I've given him, Um, but also to let them know about what healthy visual habits are. Yeah, (laughs) in some ways, Parents working from home substantially increased the amount of acceptable screen time that their children have. And it's almost as if they were using the screen time as a babysitter in a lot of ways, right? So it's in some ways, I had some parents who I'm like, hey, you can't let your kid do this. And the kid, the kid's going to do what the parent allows them to do. But during the pandemic and when we were shut down, I, I was telling parents, I said, you know, your kid is on school, all, on screens all day for school. That's it, right? No more screen time at night when you're trying to get work done, send them outside, do other things. But I think the real important thing that we're learning about screens is that, and, and I, I tell my myopia management, the 2020 two rule is what I call it. And that's the the 20 minutes, 20 seconds off. And then two hours outside is the the critical Mm -hmm. part about this. And screens get in the way of that, right? So 20 minutes on a screen is fine, but then get up and go to the restroom, go get a snack, you know, look far away, give it a screen time. It's just so important in our dry eye patients to blink as well. And that 20 seconds can give a good blink uh, recap. But then your screens can't keep you from two hours outside. So the 2022 rule helps push them outside. I like that. I I don't know what we're going to do with 2023 when when the year changes. I'm not sure. You're thinking of the future. I think that's a good rule. Um, Even further than that, though, I think I tell parents, like, I think staring at a computer or playing video games is a very different visual demand than it is to be looking at your big desktop computer when you have your homework there, because it's a very attention driven activity. So when kids are so engaged at their game, they're wide eyed, not blinking, nothing, and they are focused. I just see them like lock in. And for that, I think that kind of activity has a huge myopic demand. Whereas staring at your maybe not interesting history homework. You know, you're kind of like looking around the room a little bit. You know, <laughs> not so in right? Pick your subject. I mean. Yeah. If we but, could get children to go back to watching television, it would be far better for them than just staring at a screen right in front of them because of the accommodative demand. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It is truly a negotiation because they're not going to stop using screens at all, but I do also encourage them to take real breaks and to walk around and try to go outside because even being inside, you know, even adults don't understand this 2022 rule because they switch from looking at their computer and then, oh, I'll just check my phone on the break or I'll just read my book. 
but you really do need to remove the peripheral cues to relax your eyes and your focus. True. True. I got another crazy question. Okay. Let's hear uh, it. it seems crazy to me. Uh, how many hours a night does my kid need to wear the lenses? Right. I always find that to be a crazy question because I'm like, well, how many hours does your kid sleep at night? Right? Yeah. Maybe just as an adult now, it's like getting that eight hours. That's like peak. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> We do try to recommend eight hours. Uh, do you? But yeah, but I I don't think that every kid is going to get that amount. You know of time. why? Why do you suggest eight hours? I think that's on the directions. I think that's what they've studied. It is it? Am I wrong? And so, if a kid wore their lenses for six hours, would they not get full correction? I think it's possible that they could get full correction six hours. Yeah, but we know for certain. Um, it's better with about eight hours. Well, would 10 hours be better than eight? I think you can achieve the correction in eight. Okay. So, so it's eight. I think so. I, that's what I recommend um, with high hopes because I don't think everyone gets eight hours. Um, but that is a common question. They say, well, can I put on the lenses a bit earlier before they go to bed? And I say, if that's part of their routine, then sure, that's fine. Uh, Cause they can still see clearly through the lenses, but mm -hmm. I generally don't tell them to put it on, you know, right after dinner and then they stay up mm -hmm. and then go to sleep. Maybe like in half an hour, they can finish up reading their books or something before they go to bed. Yeah. 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 So cool. Well, Hey, it's been awesome talking with you about crazy questions that parents ask. Yeah. Uh, fantastic uh, to get your perspectives. We are so excited to look forward to the research and the impact that you're making in the myopia space. We'll be keeping our eye on you. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you again next time in the Myopia Podcast. All right, cool. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.